I'm not going to be preaching per se, so I'm not going to use the pulpit. I'm just going to take this time just to share with you some thoughts from my heart, observations, some quotes, I'll share with you some poems that I have written over the past couple of months. I will begin with a scripture reading, however, and you don't have to stand for this, and uh, you can just listen. It's out of John chapter 11, a passage out of which Kevin uh, preached last time, John chapter 11. I'll be beginning in verse 17. When Jesus came, he found that he, that is Lazarus, had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews who had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary still sat in the house. Martha therefore said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Hear the word of God. As far as an outline for this week, I'm going to talk in terms of past, present, and future past, what happened, present, what's happening, the future. Well, I can't write the future, so I'll speak in terms of what I, what Lois and I, and many others of you hope will happen. I want to say that I'm speaking for myself, and this is something that's always difficult when I am speaking publicly about the events that happened on December 24th and uh, how all of that unfolded. Every time I'm speaking publicly, I feel like there's a, a tendency to leave my dear wife out of it. And uh, all the, certainly all the sorrow that I have and that I demonstrate, she shares. Uh, frankly, she has coped with this better than I have. And I would attribute that to God's grace my lack in coping well with this, I would just attribute to my own sinfulness. Some of this will sound familiar to some of you as far as the story goes, especially those of you that were at the uh, celebration at Cornerstone Christian Academy last week where they retired our daughter's sports jersey numbers. But again, to look at the past, we're talking about what happened and to that, we've got to go back to Christmas Eve of last year. It was an unusual Christmas Eve, if you remember. It was actually a very warm, very nice day. And I uh, had been doing some things around the church. And I, I think if I understand it right, if I remember right, I was working on some things downstairs in the fellowship hall and Gianna was with me. She had her guitar working on some music. Uh, I was also doing some things outside. I don't recall exactly what, but I had left my cell phone on the top of the car of our Honda and then forgot about it. it as it was a beautiful day, I went for a motorcycle ride. It was sundown, probably around 4.30. And I thought, you know, I really don't, I don't feel like like going for a motorcycle ride, but I got to do it just to say that I went for a motorcycle ride on Christmas Eve in Rochester, New York. So I just went for a brief ride around the block or so, came back, realized that uh, by that time Lois had left, she had gone to the store, remembered my cell phone, and I was in a panic trying to find her and uh, tried to call her, 
uh, from the house, and uh, she wasn't answering. By the time she got back, uh, I look, and the cell phone was still on the top of the car. It had slid into the little deflector, the wind deflector of the sunroof. So I was thankful for that. It was Christmas Eve, and it seems like the last couple of years we have gone longer and longer uh, in getting our Christmas tree. And uh, here Christmas Eve, scrambling, I don't know, it was probably around 6, 6.30, and uh, asked Gianna if she wanted to go with me. And uh, she did. It had kind of become a custom where she and I would go to a tree farm and we would uh, pick out a Christmas tree. So I was hoping that the farm would be open. And something that had been customary also was I, I uh, forget where exactly the place is. And uh, headed down Drake Road. I should have been on Redmond Road. And uh, I remember saying to Gianna, it's like, we always forget where this place is every year. And she said, yeah, it seems like it. And she didn't remember exactly where it was. So I uh, handed her my cell phone. I said, call mom. You know, she's the expert in all things navigation. We're on the opposite of that. So Gianna uh, called. We were on the wrong road. So I cut over Drake onto 18, uh, heading west, hit Redmond Road, and I should have turned north. Uh, should have made a right. Instead, I made a left. And uh, I think I, I remember coming up, up toward 104. I'm not sure. At some point, it was as if someone pulled the plug. All I remember is being in and out of consciousness, hearing the wail of a siren. Here I'm riding in an ambulance. And I'm, I'm thinking, what, on the, what in the world happened? For a moment, I thought, am I dreaming? Is this a dream? But it seemed, though surreal, it seemed too real, though surreal, to be a dream. And I remember thinking, I don't know what happened. I don't know where, where Gianna is, how she's doing. If something happened to us, if she got hurt, if she died, I know that she's with Jesus. And I felt this sense of peace. I frankly, I've not had a whole lot of peace since that night. I learned later, and I don't even remember when all of this started coming together, because I don't, I don't remember arriving at the hospital. I don't remember the tests. I don't remember the staples in my head and all the other things. I don't remember any of that. Um, but as the story came together over the days and weeks, we were hit head on by a man named Efrain uh, Lopez Contreras, and uh, he was, he is a two times deported illegal immigrant uh, who was uh, very, very drunk. And I don't know what happened other than he hit us head on, although Gianna's side of the car got the worst of it. And as badly as I was hurt, she was hurt so much worse than I was. I, I learned that our vehicle, had an old Ford Explorer, caught fire and that uh, the accident had happened providentially in a stretch of road where there were homes right there. And had it happened further down a couple of blocks, no doubt we would have uh, burned to death in the car. Uh, but uh, the neighbors came out and uh, hearing the, uh, the impact, the neighbors came out and pulled me out of the car. I was lying sideways basically across the bucket seats and across Gianna. And with the flames and the smoke, they didn't know that she was even in there. And they pulled me out, and uh, one of the neighbors had put a blanket down, and they were trying to get me to lie down. And uh, I kept trying to go back to the truck, and I was saying, my daughter, my daughter. And they finally realized uh, that someone else was in there. And they had a hard time getting the passenger door open. Uh, somebody else arrived about that time on their vehicle, had seen the accident actually. And uh, with the help of that person, they were able to get the door open about the same time one of the neighbors arrived with a fire extinguisher 
and uh, knocked down the flames and they pulled uh, Gianna out of the wreckage. The injuries I had being in the hospital five weeks really are of no consequence to me, even though I still have things that bother me, things that uh, I'll probably deal with the rest of my life. The biggest thing is just is the brokenheartedness, the brokenheartedness that my wife has, the brokenheartedness that I have. And as far as that's concerned, that pain really started for me after I was discharged from the hospital on my birthday. And the reason for that is the realization of how bad Gianna's injuries were came to me very slowly. I'm not exactly sure why. I do remember maybe the last two, three weeks that I was hospitalized and I was able to to move about, though not very fast. I do remember going and uh, visiting the room where Gianna was, and uh, I just could not bear to see her like that. And I think uh, I just put off uh, going back the last maybe two weeks or so that I was hospitalized. But once I was discharged, um, then I was helping Lois and staying at the hospital and uh, was really faced with Gianna's progress and her prognosis on a day-to-day basis. And that was tough, especially once we got to rehab. One of the mistakes I made was, maybe biblically we would say it's putting, putting trust in chariots, uh, something out of the Old Testament. But I, I heard all these wonderful things about the particular rehab center she was going to, and a lot of people had very optimistic things to say and uh, really felt that, oh, she'll get into there, she'll get into rehab, and she'll make a a really good recovery. And the going was very, very slow. We spent uh, uh, mid-February to June in two different rehab facilities. And the memories of those right now are very hard for me to contemplate. They're very painful. Even though, as I've said before, I'm thankful that we had that opportunity to minister to her, to serve her, uh, to care for her, almost like caring for a little child. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the thousands, literally, of kisses and snuggling that I was able to get in with her as she progressed to, to, to see her at least be able to, to smile and to giggle a little bit and uh, realize in some way who we were, though she didn't know the big picture. She was far from herself, but she would really react to me. She'd stare at me sometimes, just constantly following with her eyes me across the room. I think she she knew that this is daddy, my protector, in some way, even though she was, she was like a, a two-year-old. But she was progressing, and we were still holding out hope. She couldn't talk, but she was making vocalizing sounds. But she was so, so for those of you that weren't there, didn't see her, she was so badly injured from the beginning. I think she had close to 15 surgeries broken pelvis, rods in her leg, burns, both of us. But the worst was the traumatic brain injury she had suffered, the head injury. And uh, she had uh, partial paralysis from that, and so she could not move uh, much at all, her one arm and her one leg. Her arm that did move was uh, spastically um, bound up, her wrist at a 90 degree angle. 
And I remember thinking out of fear, what is her future going to be like? I would not, I just was not able to face the fact or even the possibility, I could not entertain the possibility that she was not going to get better. And at times when I would fear that maybe, maybe she won't, I thought, what will her future be like? How much pain will she be in? Will she just be bedridden? And I know there were times that I thought, Lord, if, if that is to be her end, it would be better for her just to be with you. But God knows my heart. This wasn't a way of trying to get out from under anything. I still would have gladly, we would have gladly cared for her in whatever condition that the Lord would have given her back to us. Rehab, that whole process, oh, it was so difficult. And I'm sure that at some point I'll be able to look back at it that time and I'll be able to cull the joyous times out of the agony. At this point, I can just cerebrally give thanks for those joyous times, even though I have a hard time dealing with it as a whole without just feeling anguish in my spirit. As you, uh, as you know, she was facing what we had hoped would be a last surgery, and that was to have the bone flap put back into her head. There was a section of her skull that was removed because of brain swelling on the night of the accident. And uh, we had therapists that were optimistic. Uh, one therapist in particular talked about the many, many patients she had seen who had had that done, and it seems to help equalize them. They get a spur in, in, in recovery, and we were certainly hoping for that. It was really a, a rather routine surgery, and in meeting with a surgeon ahead of time, he warned us about uh, possibilities of infection, possibility that the, the bone may not be accepted, and you may have to use a prosthetic down the road. Uh, never, never even brought up any risk of death. The surgery itself went fine. It was the recovery, something inexplicable that I have to believe was from the hand of God that she never made it out. Massive swelling on the brain, probably as a result of carbon dioxide buildup and then lack of oxygen. And she died maybe that night, maybe the next day. I said I've been writing poetry. I've never written poetry in my life other than maybe as a small child, the roses are red, violets are blue, that variety. There's one poem that I began that I've left unfinished because every time I come to the point of her rehab, I, I just start to cry. But this sort of tells the story, and I'll read what I have. December 24th, in the early eve, we went to find a Christmas tree, a custom each year, without a doubt, Gianna and I would pick one out. It's hard to imagine we'd later bemoan Gianna would never return to our home. No tree to adorn, no presents to open. Our lives would be changed, our hearts would be broken. Knowing this not, we went on our way, the darkness of night replacing the day. The farm where each year we go in December, the exact location I could not remember. Mom is good with directions and all. Quick, take my phone and give her a call. We were on the wrong road, so I corrected our course, but I turned south when I should have gone north. What happened next, I do not recall. One moment I'm driving, the next not at all. In the back of an ambulance is where I now am. How I got there, I don't understand. Fading in and out of consciousness, this can't be a dream, something's amiss. So eerily surreal, the din, the wail of a siren echoes within. An accident, some calamity, nothing to recall, no memory. A sudden thought, did Gianna survive? 
If she did not, with Christ, she's alive. Later, I learned that the man to blame, heading north, crossed into our lane. In a drunken stupor was he, and in the country, illegally. An impact so severe, so fast, a wonder we survived the crash. Our vehicle in flames, the only light of a ghastly scene in the darkness of night. And there within the smoking mire of tangled metal and burning fire, the two of us, as if asleep, bodies lying in a heap. Surely we would have died had others not soon arrived. Opening my door, they pulled me out. My daughter, my daughter, they heard me shout. No, you lie down, you're hurt real bad. I remember it not, but as a dad, back to the wreckage I flew until those around me knew my sweet little girl was still trapped inside. The passenger door together they cried. Once it was opened, one and all could see my daughter inside. It was not only me. Seatbelt unfastened, out she came, out from amidst the smoke and flame. Once told Gianna was finally free, I lay down with a sigh of relief. The injuries I suffered, they were severe, but not at all worthy to compare to our girl so badly broken, my wounds were but a token. And there I was in ICU, the burn unit next, until February 2. I just do not know, it is an enigma to me, why it took me so long to see the full extent of Gianna's injury. Too many surgeries and x-rays to name, our poor little babe never the same. Bones and burns they can repair, will her brain ever heal, we asked in despair. Two months later to rehab we took her, our hearts filled with hope and a bright future. Somehow we felt it just had to be God's providence evident for all to see. Our ashes to beauty he would transform, why he would rescue out of this storm. In the end, what a beautiful story, and to him alone would be all the glory. Each night we would kneel at her bed to plead and pray to our great head. Meanwhile, friends all around the world joined us in praying for our little girl. But looking back, now I can see that it was my own naivety, false hope fueled by signs. It seemed to make sense. These things cannot be mere coincidence. Indeed, God is sovereign. Our prayers cannot change what he has decreed. Think it not strange, for he loves us and always knows best. In this do I trust, in this I must rest. Maybe I just need to leave it there and not finish it. I just can't go back to the time of her rehab. The thoughts will not come together and I just end up crying. Her passing was inexplicable. It gave us an opportunity, however, to love her, to care for her. It gave us an opportunity even before then, to donate her organs to those in need. And last we heard, every one of those internal organs had a recipient, and those recipients were doing well with her heart, her lungs, her liver, her kidneys, her pancreas. The past, what happened, my second point, the present, what's happening. And the present can't be divorced from the past, can it? You simply say the word now, and before the end of the ow, the echo finishes, you're already talking about the past. What's happening includes the past. I can go back to the last couple stanzas of the poem I just read, and this is part of my struggle. Two months later to rehab we took her, our hearts filled with hope in a bright future. Somehow we felt it just had to be God's providence evident for all to see. 
our ashes to beauty he would transform we he would rescue out of this storm in the end what a beautiful story and him alone would be all the glory how we were providentially rescued out of the wreckage before we all before we burned to death how Gianna survived it all her navigating through all the surgeries all those hard times without infection, pneumonia, all of that, the people that came together to pray all around the world. In the end, what a beautiful story, and to him alone would be all the glory. Each night we would kneel at her bed and plead and pray to our great head. Meanwhile, friends all around the world joined us in praying for our little girl. struggle I have cried just about every day since the accident every day in rehab I would just cry and cry since the Lord took her I just cry and I cry told Lois once that the Psalms say that he keeps our tears in a bottle. Mine are going to be in those five-gallon water jugs. D.A. Carson wrote, there's no attempt in scripture to whitewash the anguish of God's people when they undergo suffering. They argue with God. They complain to God. They weep before God. Theirs is not a faith that leads to dry-eyed stoicism. I think of the theologian Robert Lewis Dabney. Lived in the 19th century. He was a southern Presbyterian pastor, an army chaplain, and known as the biographer for Stonewall Jackson. Dabney lost his two young sons in the space of a month. In a letter to his brother, he wrote that death has struck me with a dagger of ice. He reflected on his solid hope that his two boys were in the presence of their Lord. In spite of that, he wrote, yet believing this as I do firmly, I hardly have life to rejoice in it. I don't look at myself as a shining example in all of this. I'm sort of staggering through it. You can look at me as a critically wounded brother, as a struggling pilgrim. Struggle with the whole concept of prayer. Do I pray? Yes, but in sips. I can't drink prayer right now. I pray in sips. I have a hard time with corporate prayer. Just being there. In some ways, I felt as if, maybe I should say it this way, there are times when I have felt that I had slid out on a limb high off the forest floor pleading with God and he showed up with a saw I think one of the first sermons I ever delivered here I used what I rarely ever do I used an object lesson I brought a glass jar and I was going to bring it out of the bag some of you were here remember that and I dropped it it had already been broken but you heard the crash, and I used that as a lead-in to say, have you ever been broken? And I preached a, a message about brokenness. I felt as though I had had times of brokenness, 
and I had, but nothing in comparison to this. This is a shattering to the core. And when I talk about struggling with prayer, you could see how this quote from C.S. Lewis resonated within me. He wrote this in his book, A Grief Observed, talking about his struggles after the death of his dear wife. They'd only been married a couple of years, and she died from cancer. It was his love. And he said, what chokes every prayer and every hope is the memory of the prayers she and I offered and all the false hopes we had, not hopes raised merely by our own wishful thinking, hopes encouraged, even forced upon us by false diagnoses, by x-rays, by strange remissions, by one temporary recovery that might have ranked as a miracle. Step by step, we were led up the garden path time after time when God seemed most gracious. He was really preparing the next torture. He's writing that, being very honest and transparent about how he felt at the time. And if you know the story of C.S. Lewis, he does come full circle through it. But these are the types of things that we experience when we are faced with something that we can't even imagine, like losing your only child. I struggle with loneliness. I spend a, a lot of time in the village, especially as it nears the uh, later time of the day in the evening is when I can be beset with episodes of uh, sorrow, sorrow that, that mingles itself with panic. And I go up to the village and I, I read I cry by the canal, sitting at the picnic table or on one of the benches. I have a cigar. I read. I cry. And I, I wrote a poem called The Solitude of Sorrow. I wrote this on July 5th. Why is it so that a singular delight can be shared by others? They experience the same feeling, the same happiness. But the sorrows and agonies I face ring within the lonely hollows of my soul. The grief, the tears, the fears imprisoned within the walls of that which is uniquely me. Those walls resound with my appeal. Do you know what I feel? The echo fades and all is still for no one else is there. Seven days later, I wrote The Hole Within. There is a hole within my heart, a special place that was cut out. This hole one cannot see, a cavity so empty. Can a word be inscribed on emptiness inside, or for that matter, a single letter? It must be so. I cannot see it, yet I know that written on the void inside of me, covered with tears, is the lone letter G. One of the things that is so difficult are the memories that can be triggered by almost anything. Just the song that we started, that we sang today, 10,000 Reasons, is that the name of it? But the 10,000, when I saw that, reminded me of this song, which I do not want to get into my, my head, but it's Lois knows what the song is. And it's a song that has a connection to us in rehab. There are two songs. And uh, I just, standing there as we were singing that, I just started to cry. Things can pop into my head from something I see, something I hear that can be totally unrelated. About a week ago, watching TV, watching uh, Lois and I were watching Star Trek, finding something to do, and... I had the, the captioning on. And uh, all of a sudden it just struck me that how I would watch movies with Gianna and I would have the captioning on because she would, she would watch them and my hope was as she hears the words, she might see the words and start making connections. 
And all of a sudden, I just jumped out of the chair. It was probably 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and I ran outside. There were reminders everywhere. There's her closed bedroom door. Things on my electronic devices, notes she's left me, pictures of her in my wallet. I cried when I read in one of the books that I'd been working through, Eugene Field's poem, Little Boy Blue. The little toy dog is covered with dust, but sturdy and staunch he stands, and the little toy soldier is red with rust, and his musket molds in his hands. Time was when the little toy dog was new and the toy soldier was passing fair. But that was the time when our little boy blue kissed them and put them there. Now don't you go till I come, he said, and don't you make any noise. So toddling off to his trundle bed, he dreamt of the pretty toys. And as he was dreaming, an angel's song awakened our little boy blue. words, he died. Oh, the years are many, the years are long, but the little toy friends are true. I faithful to little boy blue they stand, each in the same old place, awaiting the touch of a little hand, the smile of a little face, and they wonder as waiting the long years through in the dust of that little chair, what has become of our little boy blue who kissed them and put them there. And so I see things like Gianna's guitar in its case. Wondering when she's going to be able to come back to it and play. You want to know where my, my heart has been? I'll give you my reading list. These are books I've read or have yet to read. Grieving Your Path Back to Peace, The Mission of Sorrow, Grieving the Loss of Your Child, Comfort for Your Broken Heart, From Grief to Glory, I'm Suffering, Please Help Me, A Grief Observed, Night of Weeping, Why God's Children Suffer, The Hidden Smile of God, The Fruit of Affliction in the Lives of John Bunyan, William Cooper, and David Brainerd. A Grace Disguised, How the Soul Grows Through Loss. God Is, How Christianity Explains Everything. How Long, O Lord, Reflections on Suffering and Evil. A Severe Mercy. The Saint's Everlasting Rest. Heaven. The Mourner's Comforter. Walking with God through pain and suffering. Suffering in the sovereignty of God. Disappointment with God. The sunnier side of doubt. Written through tears. A grieving father's journey through Psalm 103. Hope for hurting hearts. A grace disguised how the soul grows through loss. What's happening? Well, I've been doing a lot of reading. I've been doing work around the church. I said to Lois about a week ago, they ought to hire me as a maintenance man. I actually have enjoyed it, getting out and doing things, repairing things. I've been working up in the bell tower um, repairing chairs, repairing a broken pew, um, working on this project, that project. I have been spending some time studying, um, outlining the entire book of Job, looking at my doctoral studies, my master's thesis and doctoral dissertation, that sort of thing. past, what happened, present, what's happening, 
thirdly, future. Future plans, future hopes, future dreams. In a moment, they're going to cue, if they're still awake back there, they're going to cue uh, an uh, audio clip. Not I'll tell you when, Dan. I don't like listening to myself. I had been listening, however, as I fall asleep at night to sermons and lectures on suffering, on grieving. And uh, I got to thinking, boy, how, how did I handle this? I know I preached on suffering. How did I handle it? Uh, did I handle it from the perspective of someone who had suffered? Did I handle it more looking at the context? And this is suffering that Peter's readers experience because of persecution and not looking at the bigger picture of suffering that is our lot in life as believers. And so I, I was listening. Part one, armed for suffering from 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 1 through 2 I preached this sermon 8 years ago on August 10th 2008 at that time Gianna was 6 years old and just 2 and a half weeks short of her 7th birthday and in the clip I mentioned a young girl who had recently died of leukemia her name was Lakin, and somehow I had come across her story and just really became enamored with it. And uh, she, she was a beautiful 12-year-old girl, and uh, many in the church prayed for her. And so uh, in the clip, I mentioned a conversation that Greg and I had where Greg asked, you know, what if that happened to Gianna? It's about five minutes long, and uh, as you listen, you will quickly understand why I about fell out of bed when I heard these words from eight years ago. Affection, when it is born humbly, encourages the heart to become disentangled from sin and weans it away from the world. Suffering loosens the tentacles of worldly allures from our lives. Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, be zealous therefore, and repent. I was talking to Greg the other day, and we were talking about a little gal that had died of leukemia. And uh, Greg asked me, what would you do if something happened to your daughter? And I said, oh, I'd probably drive uh, over to the coast of California and wander the beach for a year. And he asked me, uh, what would it do to your relationship with God? And my reply was that I would hope it would endure and even be strengthened. After all, if something like that would destroy my relationship with God, I guess it wasn't much of a relationship. It would have been built more on my own selfishness than on an unwavering commitment to him. And after all, if it happens to someone else's kid and I don't complain, why should I do so if it's my own? Why is it okay for you to suffer and I don't say, God, that's not fair, but if it happens to me, Lord, what are you doing? That's a selfish attitude. That's not a realistic attitude. Look at the book of Job. The whole theme of the book, why do the righteous worship God? Do they worship God because he somehow puts some sort of a divine umbrella over them that they don't experience any hardships in life? Or do they worship God because they know who he is, because it has been programmed on their very hearts by the Holy Spirit to worship him and follow him come what may? You can, That's cut, why you can cut it there, Dan. A righteous man worships God. Remember, In my, my reading of C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed, he says much the same thing. Feelings and feelings and feelings, let me try thinking instead. From the rational point of view, what new factor has my wife's death introduced into the problem of the universe? What grounds has it given me for doubting all that I believe? I knew already that these things and worse happened daily. I would have said that I had taken them into account. I had been warned, I had warned myself not to reckon on worldly happiness. We were even promised suffering. They were part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they that mourn, and I accepted it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Then he adds this, of course, it is different when the thing happens to oneself, not to others, and in reality, not in imagination.
talk is cheap. This is the real test, folks, when something like this happens to you. The future, well, I hope to follow up on today's message, probably speaking from over there. The plan is to, uh, again, everything is tentative. My parents are helping us buy a new vehicle to replace the one that was destroyed in the crash. And uh, if that comes in in time um, and we go through with uh, what we're thinking about doing, uh, probably uh, drive to Arizona on the way, uh, could stop at the uh, ETS annual meeting, that is the Evangelical Theological Society annual meeting. It's in Texas this year, so may stop there on the way and then spend uh, November, December, and the new year uh, with uh, family in Arizona. Uh, get back here, start easing myself back into uh, the rotation and into ministry. I'd like to preach through the book of Job. That's why I've been reading it and outlining it. Um, we will uh, start the 1st of October, uh, required 30 hours of classes to foster adopt. So we hope that next year maybe we could uh, adopt an elementary aged child or children. In some ways, I look at it as picking up the baton from Gianna who said, I want to live for whatever God chooses to do in my life that will bring him glory, who had said that a matter of uh, weeks or a couple of months before the accident. And so we want to see that furthered. We believe that she has. We've heard stories around the world, people that have been touched, that have been challenged, that have been ministered to by her life painfully through her passing into the arms of her Savior. She was only 14 years old. She's still a little girl. It's a short life. Reformed theologian Lorraine Bettner wrote, clearly accomplishment in life cannot be measured in terms of years alone. It often happens that those that die young have accomplished more than others who live to an old age. Even infants who sometimes have been with their parents only a few days or even hours may leave profound influences that change the entire course of the life of the family. And undoubtedly, from the divine viewpoint, the specific purpose for which they were sent into the world was accomplished. It is our right neither to take life prematurely nor to insist on its extension beyond the mark that God has set for it, end quote. I have to do all I can to maintain an eternal big picture perspective. Technically, Gianna was a stewardship, not even a, a gift. Eternal life is a gift because it's given and God doesn't take it back. Our physical life is a stewardship. It's been entrusted to us and God may demand it at any time. Our children are stewardships. They're God's and he may demand them back at any time. Parent, you don't know. And so trying to have the perspective, and, and one day I, I, I was just walking through the gymnasium here just crying, weeping, and calling out to God, Lord, I am thankful for 14 years of Gianna. I hurt so bad, but thank you for 14 years for that gift. Who am I to deserve 15 or 20 or 30 I told good friends that came out 
to minister to us at this time. I've known them for years. The man and his wife, dear Christian, solid believers, go to a solid church in another state. And uh, they've had to navigate through a trial. Two of their three children are gay. And uh, I told them one night, I said, you know, I'm not, obviously not closing the book on the story of your kids. We still pray for them and hope that God will bring them to repentance. But I said, you know what, I can honestly say that I would rather be in my shoes right now than in yours. I would rather have had only 14 years of Gianna with the assurance of her conversion that she rests in the arms of Jesus than have children who are in their 20s and are wayward or a child that grows up to have an outwardly successful life and outlives her parents and dies and goes to hell. You can't compare the two. And it comes down to what do we believe? Is it true? And if it's true and we believe it, then it puts everything else in perspective. What is the span of this life? 80 years, 70 years, 90 years. How does that compare to eternity? Take the most powerful microscope, rather telescope that we have that can look into the deepest regions of space. Take that distance and lay a thread across it. That thread is the span of your life. And that doesn't even compare. You can't compare anything temporal in time with eternity. And so, to bring it full circle, I'll do so with another poem I wrote on July 18th. There is a sorrow so exceedingly painful, a grief so relentlessly savage that it dances beyond the reach of description. Mere words incapable of expressing that which is experienced but cannot be explained. And these are the sorts of things that I feel. Agony, angry, anxious, broken, depressed, dismayed, empty, inconceivable, lonely, numb, saddened, shattered, suffocated, surreal. All of these words, none of these words, an existential vacuum, an eclipse of the soul, an enigmatic fracture of reality a black hole within the space of my heart that cannot be avoided, whisking me beyond the event horizon to another time and place, never to return. Never to return? Has my hope been extinguished, smothered like a spent cigarette jammed into a cheap ashtray? Indeed, my hope it often smolders, doused under the unending stream of my tears. Yet the promise stands... A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. My hope, my plea, my prayer, beyond the stormy clouds of God's providence lies the tranquil beauty of his purpose, both encompassing and transcending my sorrow. Agony will surrender to comfort, anger to peace, anxiety to serenity, brokenness to usefulness, depression to joy, dismay to confidence, Emptiness to fullness, inconceivability to faith, loneliness to love, lost to found, numb to impassioned, sad to happy, shattered to restored, suffocated to relieved, surreal to eternal. Eternal? All of those things that are indescribable in my pain will pale in comparison to those things that will be indescribable in my pleasure. For the Christian pilgrim traveling through the trials and tribulations of life lies God's event horizon where there is no black hole, only bright promises, where there is no emptiness, only the fullness of Christ. 
a place where the not yet and the already embrace. And then I, I close with two passages out of Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And then among John's last words in chapter 22, amen, come Lord Jesus. Sitting on our back patio in the midst of my tears some time ago, I came across a thought-provoking quote from the 19th century pastor, one-time board member of Princeton Theological Seminary before that school went south, a man by the name of Gardner Spring. And he wrote this, Perhaps you have seen a favorite child sinking under a disease that was appointed to do its fatal work. You have turned from the scene with sighing. Your fears have been realized. The flower is cut down and withers in the grave. Morning, parent, strive to look upward. It may cost you tears, but God would teach you that his favor without earthly comforts is worth more to you than all earthly comforts without his favor. He sent this rushing calamity on purpose to throw a temporary cloud over the sun of time and open to you the brighter scenes of a sinless world. He would cement rather than sunder the bond that unites you to the departed. That bright spirit has left you in your fondest, proudest wishes. Dust is upon them, but these sorrows have their mission. And then this. Your jewel, your child, shines in your Redeemer's crown. Would you pluck that little star from his brow? No. No, we wouldn't. But what I would give for just a minute to have her back, to have her whole, just to hear her say, Daddy, this is this was wonderful. I'm with the Lord. It's indescribable. I'm fine. You'll be you'll you'll be joining me before long. And I just want to hug her and tell her how much I love her and how proud I am of her. And then have God whisk her away again. said that the Puritan John Bunyan never fully recovered from the death of his precious daughter, little blind girl, Mary. Sometimes I doubt if I'll ever recover, and I don't even know what that'll look like. I can talk about dreams that I have, the dream of being a daddy of a little girl again, the dream of being more useful in ministry, of preaching more powerful, Christ-exalting sermons that resonate with the beauty of eternity that come from a heart that knows suffering. I have those hopes and yet when I think about them it is as if I am going out on where the ice is thin and I'm, I fear that I will break through. I know that we will never be the same. C.S. Lewis gives an analogy of recovering from intense sorrow. And he said, it's not like recovering from an appendectomy where you're hurt for a little while and after a few weeks, you're all better. No, it's more like recovering from having your leg cut off. And you're reminded every time you dress of that pain, of that injury. 
and you get on with life, and maybe you get a wooden leg, but you always walk with a limp. If you know our family, you know that we were like a cord of three strands. Mom, dad, and baby. A cord of three strands, and it is as if the Lord has come and taken a strand and pulled it out. We will always walk with a limp. One of the things that something like this does is it causes you to fear less and prepare more for your own mortality, your own death. I've always thought about those people that at a relatively young age prepared, have their funerals prepared and everything. Sometimes people even in their 40s and 50s that, that uh, buy a plot of ground and get all that stuff taken care of. And I thought, boy, how, how morbid, you know, I wouldn't want to want to worry about that. When you plant a little loved one, it puts everything in perspective. And so we have two crypts in the Riverside Mausoleum. Gianna's in one, they're both doubles. Be joined by her grandma and grandpa, my parents, and Lord willing, Lois and I, right next to it, designing the marker for the two. If, if you know what you know, the mausoleums are, they have the, the marble slabs that are, that are like this. You know, they're not on the ground. You're not in the ground. You're in a slot. And uh, one of the things that I'm looking to have put on there, and I borrowed this thought from one of the Puritans, without you, life won't be as sweet or death is bitter. Also thinking about putting John 11, 25 and 26 on there, where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. From that perspective, Gianna didn't die. She lives. She's cashing in on eternal life. And then the last part of verse 26 I thought would be appropriate for those walking by and reading simply, do you believe this? Do you No matter your state of health, no matter your age, you never know when God is going to say, today, in this instant. It's one of the things that was so striking to me with how careful I am with driving, especially on two-lane roads at night where people are going fast, 50 miles an hour or faster, watching that car coming the other way like a hawk, moving over in my lane to the shoulder, not knowing if that person is drunk or distracted. And I know, though I have no recollection of it, I, I know from my driving habits that I would have done that if he had his headlights on. And yet, boom. It's like a sci-fi movie where a character is like taken from one dimension and put in another, or taken from one time period and put to another and said, what in the world? I'm in the 1800s, what happened? I could have just as easily awoken in the presence of God, saying, what in the, I'm, I'm face to face with my Lord. Lord, what happened? Heart attack? What happened? You may go and have absolutely no preparation for it. None. He who believes in me will never die.
what does it gain a man or a woman? A young man, a young woman, to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul for eternity in a place called hell. In so many words, Gianna was challenged with that by an older woman who was discipling her. Are you going to live for the temporary fleeting pleasures of this world and its allures, or are you going to live to the glory of God no matter what he decides to do in your life? If you're not serious about the Lord, If you're not sold out for Jesus, if he's not your all in all, your hope, more than just something written on a doctrinal statement that you can sign to, because the demons of hell can sign to a doctrinal statement, but if he, is not, if he has not changed, transformed your life through a relationship with him, by God's grace, through faith alone, don't play with eternity. He or she who believes in me will live even if he or she dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do we believe that? Father, thank you for uh, this time. It's been difficult. This week has been difficult, partly because of the, you know, the events at Cornerstone Christian Academy and partly in uh, just thinking about this morning, even though I, I didn't have anything really formal planned or, or structured yet knowing Lord that it would be painful to to bring up those things which are as a dagger of ice into the soul oh I pray Lord that we would indeed all of us who knew and loved Gianna from her mom and dad on be able to pick up that baton run the race with endurance to give you glory the glory the honor, the praise, the reverence the obedience the worship that you deserve as almighty God regardless of the consequences Thank you, Lord, for this congregation. I pray that you would continue to knit us together. Thank you for the leadership, for the men that have been pastoring in my absence. Bless them. Continue to bring healing upon us all. In Jesus' name.